السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد ما دي السيسترز إن إسلام The status of women in Islam Before we delve to the topic Alhamdulillah that Allah made us Muslims Alhamdulillah for this blessing that we are Muslims that we are upon the deen which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us and we are treading upon the path of all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my dear sisters, Muslims are the only ones on the face of the globe who are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he wants us to worship him. Are you following? This is the fact. No one worships Allah as he wants us in the way that he de commanded his prophets and messengers, no one does that today except the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is an honor and this is a blessing. And we have to keep praying day and night, begging and crying to Allah to keep us upon this deen and to die on Al-Islam. Allahumma amin. This deen that brought the humanity from the darkness into the light. This deen that revived the dead nations, reformed them in Islam. As you know, the nation of the Arabs was, all, it was dead. They have all types of ills. Alcoholic, savage, fighting and killing each other for silly reasons, bearing their daughters, committing all shameful deeds and they were neglected no one is aware of the Arabs in their peninsula and when Islam came things have changed drastically the Prophet ﷺ, when he sent Rabi'i Ibn Amr to the Persians, what did Rustum tell Rabi'i? Oh, Rabi'i, did you come for flower, date? What is it? He said, No. 
نحن قوم ابتعثنا الله ابتعثنا الله لنخرج العباد من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد ومن ضيق الدنيا إلى سعة الآخرة ومن جور الأديان إلى عبد الإسلام These were the beautiful words that came from the lips of Rabi'i We are people being raised up revived and sent forth by Allah to all mankind to bring out whomever wants to guide from the worship of man to the worship of Allah and from the narrowness of the dunya the narrowness of this worldly life to the vastness of the hereafter and from the tyranny and injustice of earthly religions to the justice of Allah and the justice of Islam this is the Islam and the entire humanity has no choice except if they want the problems to be solved if they want to have peace in their life if they want to succeed in this life and the life to come there is no way in front of them except al-islam and they will as they are right now started to realize and they confess that Islam provides problems solutions for the problems I read many articles by many economists about the credit crunch and they were all saying had we listen to this had we applied the controls and the regulations that Islam impose we could this problem would not have happened they were saying and talking about zero interest rate what is the meaning of zero interest rate have you heard that what does it mean no riba right so they are coming not because they love Islam but because the necessity the need so all the teachings of Islam are for the sake of human beings so Muslims should be proud of this deen abide by this deen practice this deen and call others to this deen this deen my dear brothers and sisters and the way of salvation it's the only way of salvation and it's the way to the Jannah but this way to the Jannah has obstacles there are barriers in the way and we have to overcome these barriers we will be tested we will face difficulties but this is the way to the Jannah and this is the right way so when we face difficulties obstacles we should know that we are on the right track sisters are you following that you are on the right track Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Alif Lam Mim Ahasib an nasu an yutraku an yaqulu amanna wa hum la yiftanun wa laqad fatanna alladhina min qablihim 
فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذبين الف لام ميم دو مين ثينك ذات ذي ويل بي ليفت الون اون سينج وي بيليف اند ذات ذي ويل نوت بي تيستد وي ديد تيست ذيم ذوز بيفور ذيم اند الله ويل سيرتينلي نو ذوز هو ار ترو فروم ذوز هو ار نوت سو وي ويل بي تيستد اند وات وي ار هيرينج توداي and what we are seeing today what our enemies are doing these are tests from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to sift who is the true muslim and who is not who is the true believer and who is a hypocrite are you following so this is what allah's plan is Allah will test us because this is it the Allah's plan he tested those before us and he will test us and we are not better than those who preceded us we are not better than the prophets of Allah we are not better than the sahaba ridwan Allah alayhim so this is Allah's plan you follow islam the way to the jannah is full of hardships difficulties but it is the only path to the jannah and that leads to the jannah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says ashaddu an-nas bala'an al-anbiya thumma al-amthal fa al-amthal فإن وجد في دين الرجل صلابة زيد له في البلاء. The meaning the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is saying the toughest test, the most painful test is for the prophets of Allah. سبحان الله. The most difficult test for the prophets of Allah. then those who are close to them and those who are close to them and if it is found that there is strength in the in one's iman allah increases the test are you following or you are afraid are you scared the way to the jannah the people who will receive the most painful and difficult and toughest test the anbiya what happened to nuh his son drowned in front of him right what happened to zakaria you know brother, brother zakaria zakaria what happened to him he was cut into halves with the hook saw imagine they placed the saw in the middle of his head and they cut him into two halves alive what happened to his son john the baptist was beheaded what happened to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was choked they broke his teeth they placed the dirt on his back all these things happened to them because this is the way to the jannah and we have no other option and we have no other choice and we are now my dear sisters living in the second phase of the strangeness of al islam as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said bada al islam ghariban wa sayaud ghariban kama bada islam started as strange religion and it's going to be strange as well the first strangeness of al islam was at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the strangeness of al islam did not last 
After that, it prevailed and spread. Now we are in the second phase of the strangers. We are strangers today. You are a stranger in your home. You are a stranger in, this, in your city, at work, everywhere. But this is strangeness also will not last long. And we are heading towards the second phase and spread of Islam, alhamdulillah. And Islam will reach every corner as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that this deen al islam will reach every corner will reach every corner and every house will have a muslim in it and you are seeing it mashallah all over the world you will find islam everywhere and every house inshallah in the future will have at least a muslim inside now having said this let us now delve to the topic the status of women in Islam, it is actually Islam that gave women their rights. It is Islam that gave women the respect. It is Islam that gave the women what they deserve. So the status of women in Islam is not a problem. And there's no need to talk about it. But the problem is that the enemies are talking that women in Islam are oppressed, women in Islam are not getting their rights, women in Islam, etc. As if they are advocate for the Muslim women and they feel sad for them and they feel pity for them when we know that what they are after is that to take this muslim woman out of her deen to take you out of al islam to remove your hijab and to remove your jilbab and to wear your mini and etc that's what they are after this is the truth this is what they have in their agendas. Wake up, sisters. Spreading corruption because they know, they know very well that facing the Muslims physically, they cannot. What to do? Spoil them morally. Spoil them morally. Spread the corruption. As one of them said, Ka'sun wa ghaniyatun yaf'alani ma la yaf'alhu alfu madfa'. A glass of wine and a, and a woman will do the work more than 1,000 cannon. This is what one of them said. So this is their plan. This is their agenda. This is what they want. They want the fahisha, the evil, the moral corruption to spread. The status of women, the woman has no problem in Islam. Islam has given the woman her right before she asked for it 1400 years ago. And the woman today, in what they call it civilized world, still asking for the rights and fighting for that. Islam has given women their rights. A woman in Islam, she is protected and looked after from the cradle to the grave. As a daughter, looked after. As a wife, looked after. As a mother, throughout her life, respected. This is the status of women. A woman in Islam is a queen sitting on her throne. Sitting at home. Looking after. And shouldering the most 
difficult task. The most difficult task is bringing up human beings. Allah has given women this honor. And no one can shoulder that except the woman. And Allah has given it to you, not to us, because we cannot shoulder it. We don't have the patience. It is sophisticated process, complicated process to deal with human beings. But you have the skill, you have the potential, you are the one who is fit for that. For instance, I come home, I miss my little one, I take a bit this little baby. <laughs> For how long I will do that? Five minutes? Then take it! Because I am not fit for that. I'm not qualified. You are qualified. At night the baby cries. I shout at her. Go, go, I want to sleep. Take the, take the, the child. And the mother gets up from the sleep. Take the baby. The child cries in the other room. She feels he is crying. So you are the one Allah has honored. And for that reason, the Jannah at your feet. Because Allah knows the amount of work you do. And Allah has honored you. And has given you this difficult task. But the reward is great my dear sisters. The, growth, the reward is the Jannah. And the Jannah for us if we want the Jannah at your feet. At our mother's feet. Are you following? So that is the status. The woman in Islam has no problem. The women outside Islam should envy the women in Islam and should wish to become Muslims. And you know what? See the miracle of Islam. They are talking subjugation of women in Islam, the oppression of women in Islam. But most of the reverse are women. Hmm? If, it, if it is true that Islam oppresses women, why women are becoming Muslims? Tell me. Because that is false. Islam doesn't oppress the women. Islam gives the women their right. But because they know if the Muslim stays at home, she will produce the heroes of Islam. She will produce like Khalid, like Al Qaqa. This is what will happen. So bring her out. So no one can look after the children. Hafiz Ibrahim, Rahimahullah, is an Arab poet. He said, Al Ummu Madrasa. Ida adattaha, adatta sha'ban tayyib al araqi. The woman is. As a whole school, the sound management of which leads to the production of a noble society. Yes, the mother is a school. The mother is a school. Read about the mothers of the heroes. The mother of Muhammad al Fatah. What do you know about the mother of Muhammad al Fatah? Or you know more about Mother Teresa? The mother of Muhammad al-Fatih, the one who opened and conquered the Constantinople, used to take her son to the ocean, to the shore, and telling him, 
This is the lullaby of Muhammad al-Fatih. You know the lullaby? Muhammad, there is the Constantinople. Muhammad, he has a baby. This is the lullaby. That is the Constantinople. And Muhammad grew up and he conquered Constantinople. And their mothers will be like the mothers of Muhammad al-Fatih. This is what Islam wants. So the mother is indeed a school. If we prepare the mothers, then the whole community, you will have noble community. That's why, inshallah, this project Al-Mu'minat, that is the objective, that is the goal. Pious, righteous sisters, learned, proud of their faith, raising their heads up to the sky. They are not afraid of anyone. They learn the deen, practice the deen, and pass the deen to others. The objective and the goal, to have Muslim sisters, scholars. Do you have scholars? Female scholars? Where are they? We don't have. We have to work for that. And the sisters, they should work hard. In the history of Islam, mashallah, hundreds, hundreds of alimat that the men will sit in their circles to study from behind a curtain. And they will get the ijaza, etc. We don't have this today. But we have to plan for that. So Islam, my dear sisters, has given the women their status. And we are living in the second phase of strangeness, but the reward is great. The reward is what? Al-Jannah. فَطُوبَ لُلْغُرَبَا You are a stranger? طُوبَ لُلْغُرَبَا طُوبَ The Jannah for you. Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar radiallahu anhu said, لَتُوشَكَنَّ أَن تُنْقَضْ عُرَى الْإِسْلَامْ عُرْوَةٌ عُرْوَةٌ عُرَى الْإِسْلَامْ The handholds of Islam will be untied one after the other. إِذَا نَشَأَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ مَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ If people grow in Islam, and they are not aware of the jahiliyyah. They did not experience the jahiliyyah, the days of ignorance. Because how can you appreciate what you have when you lose it? How can you know the value of the health until you become sick? Are you following? You become sick, then you know the value of health. Where many of us born Muslims, alhamdulillah, grown up in Muslim families. So we don't feel and appreciate the value of Islam. But Umar ibn, that's what Umar ibn Khattab is saying. If you grow in Islam, and you don't experience the jahiliyyah, the darkness, the miserable life, you will not appreciate Al-Islam. So for the Muslimah to appreciate what Allah has given her, will just quickly see the status of women in the history. What happened? What was the status of women in the history? In ancient history. Let's say, take India. Women were oppressed. Day and night, women must be held by their protectors in a state of dependence. Mano, one of the philosophers says. 
the rule of inher inheritance was agnatic only for men. That is descendant traced through males to the exclusion of females. That means in the Hindu philosophy, a woman should not inherit. In Hindu scriptures, the good wife, a woman whose mind, speech, and body are kept in subjection, acquires high renown in this world and in the next. The same abode with her husband. She has to be subjected. Everything. She is a slave for her husband. A slave. This is not the case in Islam. The woman, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, they were arguing with him. Discussing with him. Till one day they made him angry. The Prophet ﷺ, he got angry with them. And he said, I will not come back for one month. And he was sleeping in the masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know that. One month. So much so that the rumor went on that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, divorced all his wives. After 29 days, he went back to his wives, and the first one he visited was Aisha. You know what Aisha did? You know what Aisha did? She stood at the door. And she said, you said one month. It's still another day. <laughs> Subhanallah. You said one month. And uh, she, because she said, I was counting the days and the nights on my fingers. She said, another day. The Prophet ﷺ said, Aisha, the, day, the month can be 29 days and can be 30 days. Let us have peace. Okay? This is status of women in Islam. They were not oppressed. And this is the prophet of Allah. Not only this. The Prophet Sallallahu He sought the advice of his wife. Help me what to do. He is a prophet and he is asking his wife. What shall, what shall I do? Musalama. And you know Khadija radiallahu anha, a woman, she was the one who was supporting the Prophet in the early days. The Prophet sallallahu wasallam, you know, in Al Hudaybiyah, when the mushriks stopped the Prophet sallallahu from entering Mecca, and they agreed that they would sh they should come the next year, and they were in the state of Ihram. So now they cannot, so they have to come out of the Umrah, they have to remove their ihram, so they have to shave their hairs. He told the Muslims, everyone should shave his hair and there's no Umrah anymore this year. The Muslims, the Sahaba, were reluctant. They didn't do that. Not to disobey the Prophet ﷺ, no. They were hoping maybe a revelation, Wahi will come down telling his Prophet, go and enter Mecca by force. So the Prophet ﷺ got angry. He, he commanded them and no one listened. He went to his wife, Umm Salama, in the tent. said, Umm Salama, the Muslims are perished. I command them and no one listens. Listen to the wise woman, Umm Salama. Umm Salama said, Ya Rasulullah, forgive them. They are hurt. They were dreaming to make the Umrah, and now the mushriks stopped them. I suggest to do the following. Go out, don't talk to any one of them. Call the barber, ask him to shave your hair. The moment they see you do that, they will follow you. And that's exactly what happened. He came out of the Prophet ﷺ. The barber started shaving the hair of the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone started shaving his hair. So the Prophet ﷺ, he sought the advice of his wife. And he implemented it. The women in Athens were not better off than the other, than the Indian women. <coughs> uh, 
even her consent in the marriage was not generally thought to be necessary. Athenian women were always minors, subject to some male, to their father, to their brother, or to some of their male kin. They, have, they are minor, like children. A Roman wife was described by an, a, a historian, quote, a babe, a minor, a ward, a person incapable of doing or acting anything, according to her own individual taste, a person continually under the tutelary and guardianship of her husband, unquote. This was the status. The status of women in this country. In Britain, all real property which a wife held at the time of a marriage became a possession of her husband. This was the situation. He was entitled to the rent from the land and to any profit which might be made from operating the estate during the joint life of the spouses. As time passed, the English courts devised means to forbid a husband's transferring real property without the consent of his wife. But he still retained the right to manage it and to receive the money which is produced, which it, which it produced. As to a wife's personal property, the husband's power was complete. He had the right to spend it as he saw it fit. Only by the late 19th century, listen to this, did the situation start to improve. 19th century. And you Muslim women were giving your right 1400 years ago. By a series of acts starting with the Married Women's Property Act in 1870, amended in 1882, and 1887. Married women achieved the right to own property only by then and to enter contracts on a par with spinsters, widows, and divorcees. But the women in Islam, listen to what Allah says. In the medieval ages, In the medieval ages, the Middle Ages, you know, they were discussing in their conventions, conferences, the, the churches, the clergymen, bishops, they were discussing what? Is the woman a human being or devil? And finally, they agreed she is a human being. Even her human aspect as a human being, they were not ready to accept that. But listen to what Allah says about the woman. Ya ayu an nasu taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa wa taqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna Allah kana alaykum raqiba O mankind, keep your duty to your Lord who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate. As you know, Hawa from Adam. And from them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has scattered and spread a multitude of men and women. So you are a human being. That's what Islam is saying. Islam did not blame the woman. As a matter of fact, in, in Christianity, the one, you know that? Allah Musta'ad. The Bible says what? The Bible says in the Old Testament that when Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree, they became naked. So they hid themselves in the bushes. So Jehovah, God Almighty, astaghfirullah al came walking in the Jannah. 
And he said, Oh Adam, where are you? Where are you? Allah doesn't know where Adam is. And here I am. Why are you hiding yourself? Because I'm naked. Oh, did you eat from the tree? Even Allah didn't know that Allah, Adam ate from the tree. This is what the Bible says. Yeah, it is the woman who, it's the woman who told me to eat from the tree. This is what the Bible says. The Quran says, no, it is Adam who forgot and ate. Women in Islam, they are like men. There's no difference at all, except in certain areas, as we mentioned in the beginning. You know, there are certain things only you can do. And certain things we don't want to do as well. I leave it to you to understand that. <clears throat> Apart from that, the salah. Woman is like the man. Sallu kama raitumuni yusalli. Siyam, zakah, hajj, everything. No difference at all. In the social aspect, as a child, the Prophet said, if you have three daughters, not three boys, and you know, subhanAllah, girls are cute, right? I know, I have, I have three daughters. And I have boys, alhamdulillah. But I know the difference. The girls are cute, beautiful. Daddy, you are not feel good. The boy comes. Buy me a toy. And you are playing with him, and all of a sudden, he will slap you and run away. <laughs> right? Yeah. So Islam says, if you have three girls, and you bring them up Islamically, that will be a guarantee for you to the Jannah. That is your way to the Jannah. Three girls. A woman said, and two. And he said, and two. As a wife, Islam has given the woman, the wife, her right. No one can force her. No one can force a woman to get married to her cousin. He is your cousin. You have to marry him. No. Who says this? The woman who, when her, has, her father forced her to marry, she came to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ gave her two options. Either to end the marriage or to leave it. She said, no, 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 I accepted the marriage. But I want the fathers to know that they have no right to force their daughters. That's what Islam has given. In Islam, the consent of the wife should be sought. Whether she is, I mean, virgin, bikr, or thayyib, divorcee, or a widow. You have to get the consent. You cannot divorce. As, as well, subhanallah, the man is encouraged to look for a righteous wife. It is the right of the girl to look for a righteous husband. My dear sisters, do not accept any brother who is not pious, righteous, practicing the deen. Don't ever accept that. Because he is going to affect you. And parents should never force their daughters to marry someone who is not religious. Because some parents, they say what? You will guide him. You will guide him. No, he will guide her to Jahannam. Wicked. He doesn't pray. Alcoholic. Do you love your daughter? No, you don't love your daughter. Because if you love your daughter, you will look for a pious, righteous husband for your daughter. Because you want your daughter to have happy marital life. And you want to sleep peacefully. Because as a father, you will be always thinking about your daughter. Even if she's married. What is her situation now? I don't know what she's going through. And you know, 
Maybe your father cannot take if you talk to him about your problems. So you are keeping your problems to yourself. So Islam says that you look for the righteous, pious partner. As a mother, Allahu Akbar, may Allah shower the mercy in our mothers. And may Allah reward them immensely for all the things they did for us. Amen. The mother. A man carried his mother on his back from Sana'a in Yemen to Mecca. And he did the, the tawaf. He performed the tawaf. And after he finished the tawaf, he asked one of the sahaba, Do you think now we break even that I did my part? He said, the sahabi, the companion told him, can your mother walk? He said, yes. He said, let her walk. All this, what you did from carrying her on your back from Sana'a to Mecca is not equivalent to one of the contractions of the labor. In women, they know what labor is. That contraction. Sometimes a woman might die, and for that reason, if she dies, she will be martyr, shahida. He said, all this is not equal to one of the contractions. So you can never, never reward your mother. You cannot. And you should never listen to your wife regarding your mother as well. Because sometimes the wife, you come home and you find both of them are crying. Your mother is crying and your wife is crying. Your mother is crying saying what? Your, your wife did this. And your wife is saying your mother did this. And you don't know what to do. So the real wise wife is the one who contained her mother-in-law. Who knows, should know the mentality of her mother-in-law. The mother in says, you don't know how to cook. I know, mommy. And you are an expert. I like your food. That's why I want to learn from you. Teach me, mommy. She is your mother. Indeed she is. And if you really love your husband, you will love his mother. You know the English saying, love me, love my dog? <laughs> you know that? Love me, love my dog. If you, what does it mean? If you love me, even the dog, you will love it. An Arab poet said, وَأُحِبُّهَا وَتُحِبُّنِي I love her and she loves me. And my camel loves her, she camel. Even the, the animals, the animals love each other. And there is law of love. And the law of love says you love your, what your beloved one loves and you hate what your beloved one hates. If your beloved one is your husband, and he loves his mother, so you will love his mother. Because what that, and also, the husband will love your mother as well. And respect them. So, you know, the mother <clears throat> in Islam has rights. And one should always try his best to be dutiful. Also mothers, there are some mothers maybe, listening to me. Mothers also be kind to your daughter-in-law because she is your daughter and you love your son and you want your son to be happy so don't interfere in their personal things are you listening mothers do not interfere i will give you this case two situation two case a brother and his wife 
they cannot have privacy. When they are together, she comes, the mother sits in between. Hmm? They want to talk, she's there. Subhana Rabbil Azim. And he said one day, we could not find a place to talk to I and my wife alone, except the toilet. And when we open the door, she's at the door. <laughs> huh? So please, mothers, give your son and his wife privacy. Tell them, may Allah bless you. May Allah put barakah on you. Keep always praying for them. Do give them nasiha out of experience. Pull your daughter in law and tell her, come here. This is not the way. I'm older than you. Learn from me. You should do this. You should do that. And the daughter in law, you, are, you, you want to know how to catch the heart of your mother in law? In the house, roll up your sleeves. Do the work. All the chores. Not that your husband goes to the office and you are sleeping in, the, in your bedroom. No. He left your ha the house, you roll the sleeves, and you do the daily chores. Cooking, everything, washing, everything. Even if you are, listen to this, even if you are away, living with your husband in another house, and now you are going to visit your in-laws, you are going to visit your in-laws, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, the moment you reach, Salaamu Alaikum, how are you, everything? Back to the kitchen, do the, ocean, the, 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 clean, the washing, the cleaning. What do you want me to do? Mother. And you know what? The father-in-law will look to his wife. Mashallah. Good, we have good daughter, Mashallah, Tabarakallah. May Allah bless you. May Allah protect you. May Allah make you happy in this life and the life to come. And may Allah make all your marital life successful. Ameen. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa